And we're live. Good afternoon. It's afternoon here in the United States on the West Coast and the East Coast, but it's evening for our guest today, Michal Oshman. I'm Danielle Ames Spivak, the CEO of the American Friends of the Israel Philharmonic. Hi, Michal. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Danielle. So good to be here. So I think I should just fill everyone in on how we met to begin with. Um, Michal is the head of culture for TikTok Europe. I hope I got your title correct. Yes. And formerly a, a leadership executive and consultant um, at Facebook and, and other places as well, which we'll get into a little bit later. Um, I do want to let everyone know that this is going to be a two-part series. So today we're going to focus on Michal's amazing book. See, I liked it so much. I have my post-its in it. What would you do if you weren't afraid, um, which just came out. And we're going to, there's so much here in content. We're going to dive into the book today. And then later in the summer, we're going to have a follow-up with um, Michal. So thank you for allowing us, you know, double the time. We appreciate it. Um, so thank you again. So this is how we met. Um, we met on Clubhouse actually. And, you know, I smile because there's a lot about Clubhouse that, I don't know, irritates me for a lot of legitimate reasons, but so much has come out of it that's so good. And, and one of those things is meeting you. We met a few months ago. I heard you speak about the book. I connected to what you said immediately. Um, and I'm just so, so grateful that we met and that we're here together today. How and I feel the same. I feel the same, Danielle. I, rem I remember, I mean, I think it was the f one of the first times I spoke publicly about myself because I've been used to for many years to be, I guess, in, um, I guess I'm a kind of a public speaking, you know, in, in my jobs. I've been working in corporate for I don't know, 20, 25 years. I've always been kind of on stage for like leadership development or, or actually presenting or helping other people shine. And suddenly the spotlight in the last couple of months has been on me, obviously, because I share my life story uh, in the book. So I was doing Clubhouse, I think it was my first time. And you're, you, it's, it's such an experience, right? And I felt, I felt, very, I felt vulnerable because I was being open and honest and, and, and very candid. And, and I felt a little bit lonely because I couldn't even see how people are reacting. And just by hearing your voice, you went on that stage, right? I can't remember the, the definition of the clubhouse. And I heard you and you said, the first line you said is like, I can so relate to what you're saying, Michal. And, it's like, oh, and you pronounced my, same, my name, Michal. And so many people find hard to pronounce my name. It's an obviously Israeli name. Then I said, okay, there's like one woman here that is already my friend. And it really helped me go through the next, I guess, 30 minutes of, of that talk. So thank you, Danielle. Well, so it's funny. I didn't. I didn't plan to talk about this. And by the way, I really never plan questions in advance because I'm just having Good. conversations. And that's also why I don't do some like lengthy introduction about your career and all that because we'll, we'll get into it in the conversation. But how important? I mean, for me, it's become even more important. Also, I, I believe in this for for younger people who are starting out in their careers. But how important it is to be able to hear from and relate to people in leadership positions and just kind of how I did with you on Clubhouse and be able to say, wow, your story resonated so much. For me, it's become even more important. I think it's, well, wow, this is, this is a big topic. I think relating to, finding people that you relate to and connecting to them and actually sharing that with them actually builds community, right? It also, if you relate to them, but you're very different to them or you, you, you have very different opinions, that creates allyship, right? So I think, regardless of like you agree disagree but connecting to people and making them feel like you can see them and you can hear them especially when you feel that they need you there um and i think one of the things that happened to me as i was going through my life challenges and i was slowly slowly dis realizing that the solution to my anxiety and my health my mental health challenges are not gonna be solved in a therapy room i was actually looking for people women that i can learn from or i can spend time with but not many were there to share in a, I guess, vulnerable or open way that they too have gone through um, similar challenges. And that's part of the reason I wrote this book as a mission to say, hey, I don't know what you think when you see me. Maybe you see, a, you know, a, someone that has this and this, like you see my CV, right? You see my, 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 uh, my LinkedIn profile, but you and no one knows what goes on in people's heads and minds and hearts when you start unveiling the behind the scenes. So yes, connecting to someone and 
and being there for them just helps them be more of, of themselves. So I'm going to just put the book up again, because I want everyone to see it and order it. What would you do if you weren't afraid? We're going to go into a lot of the, the content of the book. But I think what's so exceptional is that you weave so much personal vulnerability, like you just mentioned, which is so relatable. Um, and literally, I've posted some all the things, not even all, just a few of the things, you know, I wanted to mention and talk about today. But weave it with Jewish tradition and wisdom. And, you know, what are your thoughts on, on that kind of process that you did of kind of taking Jewish text and Jewish stories and Jewish tradition and, and making them personal and tie them into your personal life? Um, can you speak to that process in writing the book? Because you could have just, you know, analyzed text and talked from a scholarship perspective and not made it so personal, personal and vulnerable. Yeah, I, I'm, first of all, I'm all about making things personal. I was, you know, I guess like, you know, life is about experiencing life. Uh, and of course, that's a personal experience. Um, but, but I think, it, Danielle, in a very, very quick way, I mean, for uh, just to share my story. So as we said, like you gave kind of my CV, right? My, let's say, credentials of what it says from the outside. But what no one knew in my personal life or in my self, what I've been suffering my whole life was, as I mentioned, anxiety and 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 despair and i think most of my life i kind of blamed my upbringing and my parents for things that i've experienced and and when i say blamed i don't mean like blame as in like they did things purposely purposefully but just happened to be that i grew up in a home uh, which were uh, my grandparents were holocaust survivors M my first memories are hearing them screaming at night from the fear of the nazis coming to, to, to get, you know, to get me, I, I was their first granddaughter and they used to um, hoard crazy amount of food. And after they passed, uh, passed away, they were, they were like, I don't know, my mother said like hundreds of, 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 of cans of tuna and, and, and baby formula. So that was like my very early years. And my father was the head forensic pathologist of Israel. And, and for different reasons, I just saw a lot of death. So, so I evolved growing with a lot of anxiety, assuming every single minute that the most horrible thing is going to happen. And I actually thought that we weren't supposed to be happy. I, I remember my grandparents, specifically my grandmother saying that, you know, preparing me for the next Holocaust. So I was always ready. And it kind of wires you in a certain way. And my whole life, I thought that all of these horrible feelings that I have inside me, which of course I didn't share with my parents because I wanted them to be happy and proud and you know they've gone through so much you know i kind of kept all that pain in myself and only when i finished serving in the military in the idf i realized that like something's not okay i actually had a bit of a dip uh, after the service because i was so 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 anxious um, and i went to therapy and for many years i thought that those were the things that were really um making me feel so anxious and i actually thought that it was only therapy and medication that can help me heal and I had no idea, no idea at all, that there is actually a different alternative ancient way to heal myself, to heal my soul. And I had no idea I had a soul. So I was brought up in an environment that if you can't, if there's no evidence to something, it's it's not happened. It hasn't happened, right? And it was a very non-spiritual. And you know, we we were, I grew up in Tel Aviv in a in a secular home. We were very respectful of our faith, but I never knew that in in Yadut, in Judaism, in in in, in Hasidut, there's elements that are all about you know learning who you are. That there is a godly soul in you. That I I'm here for a purpose. That you know so much potential. So I evolved with life and gained all of these academic degrees. And I thank God got married and I was three children. But at the age of 38, I was so, so anxious. I found it hard to continue. Like really with children, if you're anxious and you have children, it's even more challenging as any parent knows because you're responsible for them. These are your, these are the people that you, you know, you're. So I got to a point when I knew I realized that the healing and the growth and and getting better is probably not going to come from the therapy room. Um, and I started realizing that there's a completely different way to look at life and to understand myself and to start grow myself. And that's through Jewish wisdom. And that's the discovery that I talk about in the book. I, I discovered Jewish wisdom at the age of 37. I'm now 45. So I'm very early in my learning but I'm already seeing huge amount of impact and change and healing and growth and joy 
Like I never knew we were supposed to live in joy, but apparently it's all about simcha. Um, so these are things that I taught myself and then I taught my husband and then I'm bringing home to my four children. So as a family, we've all, we're all happier now. So, so that's a great you know, transition to what I wanted to ask you next. And it actually comes a little bit closer to the end of the book where, where you talk about the notion of chinuch and education and the value of what kind of environment, um, you know, you create in the home while you're raising your children. So I'm just curious, like, if you created an afterward or a, you know, a follow-up now months or, or a year or so, I assume after you wrote the book, like what, what is the impact that you've seen on your home life now that as a family, you've become a little bit more traditional and, and clued into incorporating ritual as a part of your day-to-day existence? Yeah. So first of all, I want, because I love keeping things real, as you know, I don't want to tell it as like a fairy tale, right? This journey. So for example, one of the first things that I fell in love with and I did fall in love with is Shabbat. When I grew up, we never lit Shabbat candles. We never made, did Kiddush. You know, Shabbat was the day uh, that we did whatever we felt like doing, right? It wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't unique in that sense. There was no holiness. There was no extra dimensional. However, when you grow up in Israel, it's in the air, right? So of course I knew the concept of Shabbat, but I've never celebrated it. I've never experienced it. When I started discovering that Shabbat is actually this gift that we got to protect ourselves, this is how I tell myself this, to protect ourselves from ourselves in a way, from this lifestyle, I can only speak for myself. Like I have two phones, I have a couple of you know things that I always like, I have my full-time job and then I always like, I have like a Prussian project and then I have Hashem, four kids, I have a home, I have a husband, I have a community that I try to take an active part you know, in. I have a lot. And if someone or I don't put this limit to myself and I say at some point of this week, you will turn off your phones, you will all that noise thinking that the world can't survive without me, it can. And I'm going to make space for myself to just take a moment to reflect back at the week that I had to be with my family, full be not on other things, and then prep myself for next week. Like, I think Shabbat is a real gift that we, we received to be able to manage ourselves. So this is a very long answer to say that one of the first things that I brought to my family is Shabbat, was Shabbat. But, you know, anyone that has children or just anyone that's not used to keeping Shabbat, it's a big, it's a big shift because we miss holding the iPad. We miss watching, you know, we just, we miss it. But I actually think that practicing this in a way, self-control and, and well reconnecting to myself and for the children, it was a really um, unique experience to be able to start connecting with each other on Friday night. Um, and as I, I write in detail in the book, again, not fairy tale. We kind of sat around the table, was like, okay, what are we gonna talk about? <laughs> there's no distractions, there's 25 hours. So obviously we phased it slowly, slowly, but eventually now we have this one day in the week when we're only with each other, and it's a very, very special moment. So I think if one of the outcomes of the book is families, couples, people think, how am I going to create that one time in the week when I am just with myself, when I'm reconnecting with who I am and, and spending some quality time, I think that would be a beautiful outcome. Um, you know, I think we need it now more than ever. It's so interesting how so many of these ancient rituals and traditions, it's, it's almost like they were created for today in many ways, right? And um, that's a lot about your book is, is explaining how relevant so much um, that people would assume is kind of dated is actually the opposite. It feels so refreshing and modern in so many senses, actually revolutionary. The idea that you know, we break up this this week of work and technology seems almost like the solution to a problem before we even knew the problem existed, you know? Um, so let's switch gears a little bit because I mentioned I wanted to go into this. I so related to, to the story of when you were very early on in your career in London in the interview in which you were told that you should straighten your hair because men would prefer straight hair over curly hair. Um, regardless of debating whether that's even, you know, true or not, because my husband happens to love curly hair. But, um, you know, I think as a Jewish woman, we face this a lot. We have naturally curly, coarse hair. We feel these pressures to kind of fit in and and blend in. So can you talk a little bit about that and 
Um, yeah, and if I'm naturally touching my strength and hair, sorry, that's where I <laughs> listen. So I moved to London um, almost 20 years ago and I had naturally curly hair. And at that time, I think I had quite ginger hair. Um, and I arrived to London and there was this uh, 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 workplace consultant person. I was trying to get a job. I got an interview with her and she was really impressed by the CV and my, you know, my, my, my uh, credentials and my da la la. And she was like, but, and I felt she wanted to say something to me. So it's like, I feel like you want to give me some feedback. And I was really hoping she would say, I think you should go to an Oxford intermediate, like English class and just help upgrade your English or maybe something about pronunciation, something relevant to finding a job. But Chen was like, my really, my advice to you, if you, could strengthen your hair and and maybe not this color uh and 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 pe people like men especially take women with, with with straight hair a bit more seriously i mean and only six months after i was uh, commented about my nose i had uh, i had an i had a team offsite and someone i actually hired said um are you jewish and i wasn't kind of wasn't expecting that question i was like yes and she says oh my gosh i I heard about the Jewish nose, but this is the first time I'm seeing it. So, you know, I'm an immigrant in a country. I don't have a past. Like you feel this, like feel <laughs> you. And I'm laughing now. It's so not funny. It's like, this is pure anti-Semitism. Oh, so not funny. I mean, it's, it's pure. It's funny it's, because it's so not funny in some way. Exactly. I'm, I'm embarrassed. I don't know what to do with myself when I tell this story. I actually didn't tell this story for a very long time. But I remember I was like holding the whole offsite. I was like with my hand on my nose and and realizing I have this you know this this anti this person in my team is is, is actually talking about my Jewish nose you know in, in front of everyone so I know this is becoming a bit serious Danielle but like it is serious right so and by the way the hair is also a Jewish hair and actually I had a dream after a really painful dream when I was I was wasn't in my country I was actually struggling with English at that stage and I remember dreaming that I'm changing my nose and I'm changing my hair and I'm waking up in the morning and I can't recognize myself in the mirror. And I don't know why I'm telling you this. <laughs> I mean, I, no, I, I think it's really important we talk about it because I don't think I've ever heard someone publicly talk about this, but it's something I think a lot of people can relate to and have, a, I mean, I'm told all the time, you don't look Jewish. I don't know if that's an insult. I don't know if that's a compliment. Either way, it shouldn't be said. Um, and a lot of people face this. And I think, I mean, whether or not you're from a family of Holocaust survivors or not, I think we have this attitude of just keep your you know, keep your head down, just keep going, don't make a big deal of this, this stuff. But we need to talk about it because it shouldn't be normalized any longer. It's not acceptable. And, and and of course, I'm with you. This was this was a good 16, 17 years ago. And I'm not saying that it wouldn't happen again today. I'll tell you where I channeled this with huge ambition to, 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 you know, to grow, to thrive, to, 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 to do something meaningful. And, and, and I think, and I think, you know, you look at my hair now, it is straight. So a, unfortunately with age curls go away with age as well. Sorry to say that at anyone that is like not 45 yet, or is like still has her curls. Um, and also I got used to, you know, this version of myself, um, but it's, but it is a serious matter. And I think, I think many of us, uh, often women, we, we, we put some, like we, we put masks on ourselves or we pretend to be something to be accepted, to be in. Um, and I remember when I had this nose incident and I came to my, I came home and I, I was quite upset. And I said to my husband, do you think I should, I don't know. I, I said, I, I don't know. I've never had this. I've never had to deal with something like this. And, and, and he was so proud of me and helped me remind myself that like, I should be really proud of myself. There's often this part when you get, you get a bit raw and you forget who you are and then, you, and then you have to pull yourself back and kind of be proud. I think the book is also about being proud of the Jewish wisdom and actually knowing that there is a Jewish wisdom. And by the way, it's a universal Jewish wisdom. And, and Danielle, I know you, you know you read the book, but the book isn't about... Um, it's not a religious book. It's a spiritual self-help book and it's a universal book. And I have friends and colleagues who are non-Jewish and they just found this book so helpful because we all have a godly soul inside of in us. We're all here for a, per, for a reason to, to, to play our role in this world. And this has nothing to do with what, you know, faith and how we live and where we live. It's, it's us as human beings. And, and my, my mission with writing this book 
is exactly the mission that I have as, a, as in my career is building bridges between communities, between people, between, between ideas. And my hope for the book is that it will build bridges and actually people will have show curiosity to like, what is this Jewish wisdom? What is this wisdom that is created to heal the soul before Freud's? Freud, Freud, Freud was like, it's 200 years ago. We've been suffering these feelings for, for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why, so, th so there's many reasons why I think the book is exceptional, but one of the reasons is because you wrote it, right? It doesn't come from a rabbi. It doesn't come from even a rabbit's in. It doesn't come from um, a PhD in Jewish studies. It comes from a, a regular person. And I think that there's a misnomer out there amongst most Jews, because most Jews, unfortunately, were not privileged to have a really strong Jewish education, especially, you know, outside of Israel and the diaspora. But even now, I think in Israel, there's a lot of Jews who, who don't have a background, unfortunately, and don't really realize that a lot of what we seek elsewhere, right? I mean, I love yoga. I like actually like meditating if, when I can pull it off. But at the end of the day, it was all here first. It's, it's, it's all in this book, you know? Um, so can you talk a little bit about, you know, why, because there was probably a moment when you were thinking about writing it where you're like, but I'm not this and I'm not this. Am I really qualified to even be writing it? Of course, every single day I have this thought, of course. <laughs> I, I, felt, I felt commit, obliged, like I had to share this book. And, and this book is these wisdoms that I consumed, right? This is like my, this is when I was like, whoa, I just made this incredible discovery. And, and I didn't, and I came to it from, yes, from emotional pain, but also from strength, right? I chose this, like I, and I'm a person that learns, and I think it's a good place to learn from challenge, right? I was like, not, I'm not I won't accept everything that I'm told. So I wrote this book because I really think that everyone and anyone could potentially benefit from learning these concepts you know, for example, I know you and I, I think, shared this in another conversation. I, I was all my life, I was trying to be perfect, Danielle, perfect. And every and any way, right? Yeah. Inside, outside, pleaser, oh, goody, goody. Yes, of course, I'll do that. And every time I failed or I thought I was going to fail, that's it, I'm, I'm dying inside. I thought that we were supposed to be perfect. And actually, I, I, I think I, I did believe in God my whole life. I didn't know how to explain it, but I did. So I thought like, it's a disappointment for everyone if I get something wrong and actually we're supposed to be perfect. And then when I, when I learned this am amazing ch Hasidic uh, uh, saying, which is there's nothing more complete than a broken heart. And that we are, the only way we can grow is through our mistakes, either when we break ourselves we disappoint ourselves or, and, you know, God forbid others break us. If it's like heartbreak or God forbid big things that happen to us. It's only through those cracks, the pieces between the, you know, the bits of the broken heart that the growth, I mean, it's not comfortable and we don't want it. We don't want it. It causes us shame and ugh, it's like that kvetch feeling like I just, ugh. I'm, but it's only through those experiences of, of breaking and getting things wrong and disappointing that we really do grow. So suddenly my whole outlook at life was like, okay, so if something doesn't go right in my marriage, in this phase of my marriage, it doesn't mean that it's over. It doesn't mean that he's gonna leave me. It doesn't mean that he doesn't, and, and, and I know I'm half speaking now, right? But like, these are the thoughts that I would have. I would go really extreme. It means that we have a moment here to understand what is this breaking and, and, and grow from that breaking. So that means that you start getting comfortable with the uncomfortable. And my whole life I was trying to get rid of anything that was uncomfortable because that was like unperfect. So those are things I didn't get in therapy room. Those are things that I got from, 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 from Judaism. These are deep concepts in, in the adult. So along those lines, you know, I think something beautiful, I think it's in that same chapter when you talk about, which I very much can relate to of, the anxiety over disappointing people that you love and admire. Um, you know, you also talk about obviously how successful that you've been. And this is something I think about a lot, which is the, like, the two sides to the coin. It's the same coin, right? Like the, the, what is motivating you to be successful and your ambition 
um, is also one of the reasons why you were a perfectionist and didn't want to disappoint people. And so you were able to channel it into doing good and excelling and giving back to the world, et cetera. And so, you know, the more I read your book, but also just from aging myself, the more I really understood that almost everything is actually the same root, right? It's the same emotion or the same drive or the same root, especially if it all comes from your neshama, right? Your soul from a place of good ultimately, right? Um, but it, it's how you channel it. Yeah, yeah. And getting used to that tension, right? That, that tension. And I agree with you, you know, when, when I had that life coach who asked me if you wanted to cut, like if you had the option to cut the anxiety, and it was so tempting to think, oh my gosh, I could cut, if I could cut the anxiety. But then I realized that's also my fuel, right? That's also my, that's how I'm always on alert, right? That's always, I know what to, you know, to think fast, to move fast, to always be going, to be doing. So I think one of the roles, and that's, I, I, I guess that that's one of the reasons God, Hashem created this this way with all these internal tensions, with the good and bad, with the, with the giving and with the ego, right? So I think, you know, no one wants to feel these difficult feelings. I do believe now that, you know, if, if someone suffers severe anxiety or, or, or panic, they should, of course, get medical treatment and look at these things in a very serious way. And of course, I'm not a counselor. I'm, I can only share my own personal experiences. But I do think that there, as you said, there's different layers and different parts of this, you know, all sorts of feelings. Sometimes they're fantastic and they serve us to grow and to fulfill our mission. And sometimes they're damaging us. They take us down. They give us sadness and despair. And that's where you have to kind of know how to navigate it. Uh, but we have a long life, uh, you know, to, to, to do. So again, I always wanted to kind of solve now. No, you know, take a minute. It's a journey. That's the other thing I love about Hasidut is that if you messed up something and you got it wrong, like the following moment is the moment you can get it right. So there's no drama. There's a huge amount of potential. It's not a drama. And, and I just find that really personally very empowering. You told me something beautiful while you're speaking a little while ago about, I think, a friend of yours who said to you, you know, no one's doing all the mitzvot today anyway, right. because the temple hasn't been rebuilt. And I think that that's really powerful. I think sometimes we're all deterred. We have like this inclination to not, you know, dip our feet into something if we feel that we cannot do it 150%, you know, for me, it's with, with exercise for sure. Like I don't right. think enough time to exercise fully. So I'm not even going to go once. Why? That's the silliest logic. Right. <laughs> um, so I love that about, you know, the idea of mitzvah and Judaism and, and doing good. And actually I think it can be connected to philanthropy too, which is, you know, the space that, that I'm in and we're in or, or even cultural in general and participate in cultural activity and community and events, because, you know, you might not be the subscriber, but going once a season, I'm using it as, an, as a metaphor, right? Yep. Um, there's a place for that, you know, and not forcing ourselves to do all or nothing and being able to kind of grow as something. So um, absolutely. I, I'm, I'm an, I had enough with the all or nothing. I like enough. That's like the old me, like something, a step, an act. Um, I actually think that one of the beautiful things about, about actually Judaism culturally, it's, a, it's anything but kind of being passive it's all about taking action you know that's why I love the song about right the whole entire world is a very narrow bridge and it's all about not being fearless right take that step and if you say if a step is going to one event if a step means practicing one thing trying something you don't have to go full Monty and I remember as, as you mentioned I said to a friend I'm not doing all of these like, are you doing one thing that's giving you meaning? So you did the whole thing. Um, but because we're so, so often so hard with ourselves, we often stop ourselves from ourselves from taking one step because we're not going to go through the whole ocean. No, take the one step. Like you have to start somewhere. And I really try to give this as um, kind of food for thought for my children when they have, let's say, uh, a, a soccer kind of, uh, you know, like a test, like audition. It's like, oh, maybe I won't get it. And maybe you will get it. So, you know, just start wiring them for, for, for trying. Um, I actually think that what I sometimes see is people, because they don't want to fail, they actually don't do. 
And then that kind of puts life on hold. And I am a huge believer in doing. So maybe, um, cause I know we're almost out of time. Maybe the next time we speak, we'll talk a little bit about that in terms of workplace culture. Cause I know it's something, you know, it, whether it was Facebook or where you are right now, you did a lot of work and kind of detouring people from, from fearing the failure and instead of fearing the failure, kind of embracing it to, to succeed and experiment and innovate. So I feel like we have so much more to talk about, but let's end off with, will you just share with us? It's been what, like a month and a half since your book came out or just a month? Yes. I don't remember. Yes, now. Yes, a month and a bit. Yes, you're good. And you've been all over. And I listened to your podcast with David Suisa the other day, which was beautiful. And you know, what, what type of reception have you gotten from the book and anything that's been surprising? Any, um, anyone reach out to you that's been wow to you? So just tell us a little bit about that. I'm blessed, all of the above. I'm so grateful. That's how I'm high, high energy. I'm needing less sleep now because there's lots of, you know, doing to do. I'm, I'm, I'm truly grateful, A, you know, to, to, to my publisher and to my book agent to kind of birthing this book to me, with me. But also, yes, listen, Danielle, from all over the world, like places that I have to obviously Google because I don't know where they are. Uh, people taking- That is people, so cool, by the oh, way. Oh my God, I love, I love Google. And I was like, oh, I want to be there with you. And then you discover, you discover communities, you discover people. And of course, more than anything is people trusting me with their own stories. Um, and really hundreds of stories of people from, you know, all, all sorts of upbringings and experiences and where they are in life. And they're feeling afraid. They're feeling afraid to make a decision. They're feeling afraid to tell the truth. They're feeling afraid to be honest with themselves that they're, they're, they, they, but they want to grow. So I obviously try to respond to everyone and, and, you know, just, just say I'm here and I, I, I hear you. Uh, it obviously gives me a huge amount of hope and energy around the book. Um, and, and you're one of those people. You're one of those people that giving me now, you know, a platform, a space for this conversation to be able to share it with who anyone can, that, you know, can, can benefit from, from reading and ex experiencing and, 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 and getting to know the, you know, the, the amazing life-changing uh, Jewish, Jewish wisdom. And um, I'm really, listen, if you feel my heart now, it's, uh, it's full of joy and, and, and gratitude. So um, it's, a, it's, it's very, very special. Thank you. And, and how beautiful with the technology at our disposal that like literally hundreds of people are watching this live right now and thousands will watch because it will be archived on Facebook and our website. And um, I'm so grateful that you're so many thousand miles away, but I have this new great friend who I can't wait till we get to be together in person because I feel so connected to you and close to you. And um, I just thank God for that. So let's keep going. Yeah. I can't wait till we can do this again. We're doing it again. We're doing things together. We're repairing the world, and and you know we can only go up um, for for better, greater things. Um, so you know, thank you so much, Danielle. I am looking forward to coming back to sharing maybe other things, maybe less comfortable things, but things that need to be spoken about that need to be repaired. Um, I um, I can't wait to see you again. I'm just gonna put the cover of the book up again with oh and I love the green green's like one of my favorite colors and just oh the gold and I wanted to ask you about your dress I like literally was looking at the cover on Shabbat when I was reading a second time being like how did you decide what you were going to wear on the cover all that fun stuff but maybe we'll talk about that <laughs> I love gold I love gold I also think it's such a beautiful like Yerushalayim mm. uh color and for me gold is just it's it, it's a yeah connects so yeah I'll tell you more about this, <laughs> this you, well. next time <laughs> okay well good night in London and thank you to everyone who watched and we'll see you again soon thank Bye. you Danielle thank you everyone